tell you a little bit now about uh, what we think is happening with memory. And this is a very interesting that we are presenting to you. But let's see where we go with it. But before that, let me just introduce you to our labs. So this is our new lab building, and my office is somewhere underneath the underneath the sand or underneath the grass over there. <laughs> you can't see it. Um, but uh, it's a very nice uh, campus. And any of you who happen to be in Bangor, some of you have actually been there yet? You have not yet. Some people have been to Bangor. We actually have an institute wide collaboration both with uh, Brandeis and with uh, Edinburgh University. And so they do visits by various people at various times. Okay, and we're all going to come by. So that's where I work. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, all the, you know, what, so my, my personal favorite interest in all this chemical computation, which is memory. So I'll give you a bit of background and I'll tell you about where it's all started and sort of when I got interested in, in these questions and then things have been going steadily down ever since. So I'll tell you about different kinds of plasticity that we have and then give you short trip to the zoo, which is basically showing you exotic specimens of, of uh, bistable systems, which are systems which can store information uh, through chemistry. Okay, so, you all know what that is? Yeah? <laughs> okay, good. Now, one of these days, and I'm threatening all you young people out there, okay? one of these days, you're going to run into your, your uh, junior colleagues, and you're going to say, you mean you guys actually store information on round things going, you know, metal things going round in circles? How, how IT could it? So, going the other extreme, I suspect I'm the only person here who's actually written a program on a, on a paper punch on, on one of those paper cards. You do you the program? Ah, okay, I have company. I have company in the Dinosaur Museum. Okay. All right, so, paper punch cards are, well, yeah, another, well, for you, that's that really amazing, right? Okay, so this is a form of memory. And uh, this is this kind of memory, if I don't get to stay there, works because you can write information and it stay there. It won't stay there forever. But the time course of demagnetization of any of the leaves your hard disk is very long. Yeah? And what the, the neural analog of this is sort of a fuzzy idea which people have, which is incorrect, that building a structure, a physical structure, because of course, physical structure in the brain is nothing but collection of chemicals, molecules. You build it and what you build will stay there. But as we already discussed, the lifespan of any individual molecule in your brain, in your synapse, is of the order of minutes to days. So actually, physical stability doesn't work. And it's not enough just to say that I have built an axon or an dendrite or a synapse. And once I put the molecules there, that is going to store information. It doesn't work. So this kind of stability won't really store information effectively in the brain. Okay, what's, so you all know that kind of memory? Yeah? That's your dynamic RAM. Now this is called dynamic RAM for a very good reason, which is that actually... Good. Okay. Actually, it's very forgetful memory. This is a kind of memory where you store information by inserting some charge into your uh, memory elements, but these are all capacitive. And capacitors, as you know, if they have any finite resistance, they will slowly discharge. And the time course of this discharge is of the order of a few milliseconds for, uh, for a dynamic RAM. And so you have all these elaborate circuits which basically go through all the contents of a dynamic RAM. They do this invisibly, so it doesn't you, but they go through all the, every single memory location, they read it, they read what's in there before it's lost, and then they write it back in, so that it causes the actual store contents to be refreshed. Right? In the good old days of computing, you, the microprocessors you have to deal with this, now the chips take care of themselves. So this is a way to store information for a long time, but it requires that there's a continuous refresh. And there's actually a neural network analog of this, which is a reverberating memories, where you say that you have a piece circuit of neurons, and you have some kind of feedback process. 
such that this amount goes on this mirror and so on, and then you have the reverberating activity going around for a little while for it as well. So we'll just ask you to put the microphone on. Sorry, we forgot about this. We got that. Sorry about that. <laughs> Start all over again. Okay. Um, I work in this. Uh... <laughs> okay. So reverberation is another way that you can store information, and it's actually there are actually brain circuits which are believed to do this. Okay. Okay, anybody recognize this? Good, good, good. Some people have studied uh, computer logic, okay. So this, each of those is a NAND gate and it's connected in a particular configuration which is a bistable system. So this is called a static uh, memory, static RAM. And actually, again, a very large class of memory in your computer, a very important class, uses this form of storage. And that's the high-speed memory that is built into your chip, into, the, into your processor itself. This is the cache memory. So this form of memory, if you actually work through the logic diagram, will stay there in a completely stable manner as long as power is applied. Yeah? And that is the form of memory that I'll be discussing uh, in a little while, where you have bistability, where you have two states the system can adopt, and it'll stay there as long as power is applied. Power in this case meaning that as long as the molecules are refreshed and as long as ATP is available. What is ATP? How many of you have heard of ATP? Yay, okay, how many know what it is? Okay, <laughs> all right, so you know what it is and you've heard of it, right? It's to, to adenosine triphosphate is the energy molecule, so to speak, in the cell. Actually, well, yeah, let's, let's just leave it, leave it there. Okay, so the question which I'm going to not fully answer, but I'm going to sort of leave dangling, is whether memory is the same thing as synaptic plasticity. Yeah? So I'll give you some arguments for it, and there are, of course, plenty of arguments that say that that's definitely not the whole story, but a lot of information is very likely stored through synaptic plasticity. Yeah, you all know what syn synaptic plasticity is? Not, 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 not. Okay, good. Okay, so this is the ability of individual synapses to change their weight, which is the efficacy of information flow from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell. So let me just run you through this because this is a kind of figure that you'll be seeing again and again. So how many of you have seen this kind of experiment or seen this kind of a trace, right? About half of you. So what you have here is uh, you catch your, this is a typical brain slice experiment, but you can do it in, in tissue culture and you can do it in vivo if you like. But I'll give you the gory details, literally the gory details, right? You go around, you catch your mouse or your rat, yeah? You remove its head and you take out its brain and you do this really, really, really fast. And of course you have to do this in accordance with all the animal ethical procedures of your institute, otherwise you're in big trouble. Okay, so you remove its brain, you have to do it fast because if you take a long time over removing somebody's brain, what happens? It dies, that's right. Good, so you take it out really fast and you put it in oxygenated ringers, which keeps the, which is basically a poor substitute for your cerebrospinal fluid, but it's got enough oxygen and enough glucose and enough good things in there to keep the slice alive for a little while in a dish. And then you slice it into sections about 400 microns thick. And with that, you have intact a little circuit in the hippocampus. You have a little circuit where you can selectively stimulate the presynaptic side and record from the postsynaptic side. Okay, so you're doing that. And what you can do is every stimulus, you record the, in this case, the field EPSP, don't worry about the details. You record the output and you establish a baseline and we're going to call the baseline one. Okay, and you can see that it's pretty reliable. Yeah, each of the little spots represents one measurement. And so for about half an hour, you've established the baseline. And then you do something horrible. You can do things like pouring in KCL or you can zap it with large uh, amounts of current or many, many high frequency stimulus or put in other interesting chemicals. And, but you only do this briefly. So let's say 10 seconds to five minutes or so. And at the end of this, you get a huge increase, in this case, two and a half times increase in the synaptic strength in the efficacy of getting your output 
given the same value of input. So what the input that used to give that level one of output now gives 2.5. It declines a little bit, but then it stays stable for a very, very long time, okay? This has been measured in slices for up to eight hours roughly, and it's been measured in vivo, I gather, for almost a year, okay? So this kind of, I mean, not, not at that level, but it's still measurable for a very, very long time. So this is a typical experiment which measures synaptic plasticity and the variance of this which will actually measure what happens at one single synapse between one axon and one spine in a postsynaptic cell. Yeah. So this is the kind of uh, measurement which allows you to figure out what's happening in a synapse. Okay. So now you've all heard of this, this famous statement. Yes, no? Familiar? To whom is it not familiar? <coughs> No one is going to admit. Okay. Anyway, this is Donald Hebb. His rule says, and I'm going to hit it yet again, when an axon of cell B is near enough to excite, a cell, cell A is near enough to excite a cell B and repeatedly or persistently takes part in firing it, some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells such that A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. Okay. Otherwise, known as cells that fire together wire together. All right. So this is a very general statement, and in fact, it's sufficiently general that both the uh, form of plasticity you see here and spike timing dependent plasticity can actually be inter extracted from this, uh, from this uh, statement. And you can see that he did this a very, very long time ago when a lot of these principles were extremely fuzzy. So he, he established all of this. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is that's sort of the, the context in which, in which this story is going to play out. So let me start with the good old days, if I can persuade this thing to stay put. So the good old days is when I started to get interested in these questions, where actually the, the question of, of memory was a relatively simple one, right? You needed associativity. You needed to know when an event was worth remembering, in other words, yeah? You needed some kind of logic to decide the relevance of this, of the, of the signal that came in, and you needed some kind of switch to store the information for a long time, a bi-stable, because even back then it was pretty clear that <clears throat> the hard disk kind of persistence of memory or, or the, uh, the reverberating switch kind of thing wouldn't work. So you need some kind of uh, bi-stable system. And there were candidates for all of these, and that would give you memory. And it looked like we, it looked like a lot of it was already sewn up, right? So we, maybe that's when I should have uh, said, okay, we've, we've got this sorted out, let's, let's wrap it up. So let's, let's take an example view of things from around that era, yeah? So how many, you all know about Pavlov's experiment? Yes, yes, yes. Now the usual suspects are all nodding. As long as, long as they're not nodding off, it's all right. Okay, so in Pavlov's experiment, just to remind you, you have a doggy. Pavlov was actually interested in the digestive system. Okay, but like a good scientist, he was alert. He was interested in measuring uh, salivation and properties of saliva. And so he had a way to measure the flow of saliva from these dogs. Yeah, so he had a drip meter basically, a drool meter. And what he noticed was that the dogs, which were presented food every evening, um, salivated, which is what they naturally do. So this is the unconditioned stimulus, right? So without any particular training, maybe it happened in their youth, the dogs knew that the presentation of food is, a, is something which should be followed by salivation. Good. However, because this was running in a, a typical lab, there was a bell that rang a few minutes before the uh, food was given out, presumably to tell the staff that it's time to hand out the food. And the dogs learned to associate this, and what Pavlov noticed was that the bell started to cause salivation. Okay, so this is classical conditioning, the bell being the conditioned stimulus. So now let's, let's, let's take an, a completely reductio ad absurdum view of this and reduce this down to just a few neurons. Yeah? This, is a, this is completely f fictional, but it's a, it's a good way to start. So here's your food, and your food is connected to the salivation neuron. So when the food comes, this stimulus turns on the saliva. Okay, nice and straightforward. And of course, completely fictional, but let's start with that. Good. So now, let's suppose that we have this sequence where 
you have a bell neuron, which is the neuron that responds to the bell. And let's say, just for the sake of argument, you have another neuron that responds to a light, a light flashing. OK, now what happens? So you start out, the food comes on, the dog salivates. The food comes on, the dog salivates. However, the bell is always preceding the food. So this pairing happens often enough that in due course, if we were to strengthen this synapse, yeah, through this repeated association of bell coming before food, bell coming before food. And if there was a learning rule that said that every time you have something on the, on the presynaptic side here followed by activity there, to strengthen that synapse, and only that synapse, then in due course you could learn that when you get activity on that, uh, that cell, you should salivate. Okay. Furthermore, you also would have, this, have to have specificity because you don't want the dog to learn that when the light goes on, it should salivate. But in principle, and can, uh, can and has been done, you can go the other way around. That is, you can have the light as the conditioning stimulus and the bell be something completely random. And now the dog could learn that actually it is the light that matters. So you have to have stimulus specificity. Okay, so the strengthening should only happen where you have the association. Okay, so what I've tried to do here is in this toy model to show you that having this kind of logic of association of activity here with here and strengthening of a synapse you can actually get something that looks like a classical learning behavior, right? That is, you see an association of, uh, of, a of a conditioned stimulus with a response, in this case, salivation, yeah? In principle, happening through the strengthening of a synapse in a very specific manner. So this is sort of the toy model and the, the good old days view of, of how things might work. But one can be a little bit more elaborate than that. So, just to drive home the point, the NMDA receptor actually has a lot of the features that are needed to do this, to do this operation. That is, you have your, let's get back. Okay, good. So you have your uh, receptor, which is sensitive to glutamate, and it's also sensitive to the potential here. Why is it sensitive? It's there on the slide. Why is it sensitive to the, to the potential, post, to the postsynaptic potential? Yeah, just as a hint, that's a magnesium ion over there. MG block. MG block, but why should MG block it? It's hmm? voltage dependent. It's blocking? No, so, uh, magnesium is voltage dependent, so it depends on the postsynaptic activity. Well, I mean, magnesium is just an ion. Yeah, the, blockage. the blockage is voltage dependent, very good, right. So the idea is that the magnesium is a positive charge and it's sitting there and it's plugging this receptor. And so when the postsynaptic side becomes positive, it just repels it out. And so then you get conductance, right? Exactly as you were saying. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the molecular logic there, right? You have association of a high potential postsynaptically with the presence of the neurotransmitter. And when you have both of them, then the channel opens and calcium comes in. And calcium, as you all know, is a sort of the, the grand, grandfather uh, transmitter. It turns on everything, pretty much, in the cell. So you get calcium coming in, and then you can expect all sorts of fun things to happen, such as increase in uh, synaptic strength, for example. OK. So why am I so hung up about synaptic weights? Yeah. So. The reason why this is important and why I think it's a reasonable place to start looking for a cellular or biophysical basis for memory are, are several. So first of all, there's lots of synapses on every cell in a mammal. Yeah? Well, for the matter, in, in an invertebrate as well. But the, this is a good large number, and so in principle, it, gives, it confers a very large uh, memory capacity. Secondly, synapses are specific. Right? It means that one axon will connect very specifically through that synapse to the target cell. And if you, ch if you want to change things specifically, you, can, you, you have to change that one weight. And so then you get very, very specific uh, strengthening of the input-output coupling. 
Yeah. Another reason is simply that the uh, that if you assume that synapses are a good way to store information, you can actually make lots of theoretical predictions, and I'll go over this in a little while, which seem to make a lot of sense, that such networks actually do things which look a little bit like memory. And finally, synapses actually seem to be equipped to do all of the good things that we would like to do uh, within what we understand. So let's look a little bit more detail at uh, some typical networks and where synaptic plasticity happens. So you've all seen a network like this, right? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. So this is your standard feed forward network. And the nice thing about this is that your quote unquote neurons, these little round things, which aren't very much like neurons, but they're called neurons for the sake of argument. They're very, very simple. They're just some kind of summation rule and some kind of output function. The interesting stuff in this network is actually the synaptic weights. And what you can do with these networks is actually quite, quite interesting. Um, just by setting the weights appropriately with some kind of learning rule, you can train this network to learn by example. As opposed to what you have to do with your uh, computer, which is to train it by explicitly putting information into a particular location in memory, which is what you do when you write a file or something like that. So here you just give this network a lot of examples and it will learn something yeah, through an appropriate, learn, uh, appropriate learning rule. Of course, a lot of examples, unfortunately in this case, sometimes is a very, very large number of examples. So this is something like your idiot child of neural networks if you use the, the simple learning rules. But nevertheless, it is a way to, just by changing the weights, you can learn some fairly sophisticated things, like for example, how to pronounce English words. Uh, given that the spelling is completely uh, irrational, yeah? Okay, so this is a very, very old example. This is something that Terry Sijnowski did years ago in a program called NetTalk, which at that time performed as well, if not better, than a huge and very tediously assembled uh, database of English pronunciations which uh, DEC had in, in implemented, digital equipment had implemented. But he did this real neural, neural network and basically he, the input layer got the, the letters of the, of that made up the word and the output layer was able to generate the phonemes, the sounds that you should expect it to produce. And it did pretty well on most things except for, uh, you, know, you know George Bernard Shaw's example of how irrational English spelling is? Yeah? Yes, no? All right. Though, how many of you know how to pronounce this? Yeah? No. How many of you know this one? Fish. Yeah? You know this. Come on. It's, it's a. Yeah. Enough? Women? Motion? Fish? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, I suspect that even, even NetTalk would have had trouble with that one. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so anyway, English language is completely irrational in its spelling, um, but this neural network was able to do something with it. Okay, here's another kind of neural network, the auto-associative uh, fully connected network, also known as the Hopfield network. Um, this is actually very reminiscent of the circuitry of at least two parts of the brain. One is the uh, piriform cortex and the other is the hippocampus. And without going into details, again, the, one of the key parts is these, okay, let me just describe this a little bit. Each of these round balls is, represents the soma, the stick part represents the dendrites, the lines going around represent the axons, and the little circles represent synapses. <clears throat> so this is a fully connected, a recurrent network, and it's getting, in addition to that, it's getting <clears throat> heterosynaptic in, in, sorry, he heteroassociative input from this set of inputs, and then you have your fully auto-associative part over there, and then you have your outputs. And this is actually pretty good at uh, doing various kinds of uh, recognition and uh, pattern completion. Um, just, just for reference, uh, these are the learning rules, so to speak, for the Hopfield network. And the key thing is that these are synaptic weights. Yeah? 
So again, the information in this network is stored in the weights. So this is another reason why we should be interested in synaptic weights as an underlying basis for memory. Of course, it's a little bit hard to see how you get this sort of thing from Hebb's rule, but in fact, you can do it. And I'm not going to go into those details. Just to show you, uh, these are a couple of examples of what this kind of network can do. So it's trained on the face and some random pattern through the assignment of synaptic weights. You give it a partial face, just the top of the bonnet, and it remembers it. It reconstructs the face, so to speak. And you give it a very, very scrambled version of the face, and it re reconstructs it too. And one way of thinking about it is that the, the, each of these uh, states of memory of the network is some kind of an attractor, and it falls into whichever attractor is, is closest to it. Interestingly, this figure also applies to bistables, and I will, I will go to that later. OK, so now I had promised or threatened, either way, depending on your point of view, to tell you about uh, a bit more about feedback and bistability in chemical systems. So let's go there. So here's a very simple feedback circuit. A activates B, and B comes back and activates A. And we've already got some kind of a hand-waving idea of how this can store information. Let's do it a little bit more a little bit more depth in this. Supposing we do what a chemist would do to measure this, this kind of a circuit, which is you ask, given a certain amount of B, what will be the activity of A? Right? And a chemist would do that by, say, blocking the effect of A back onto B in some, some clever way or the other. And what a chemist would also do is to plot the dose-response curve. That is, you say, have this amount of B, the stimulus, and that will give you that amount of activity of A. And you can get a fairly typical sigmoid through this. OK. Now let's do the converse and ask, to complete the, the analysis, you ask, what happens if you have a certain amount of A and you measure the amount of B? And now you get another kind of curve in red this time, which describes the activity of B as a function of A. So now to complete the picture, you have to ask, what happens now if you just let the system run freely. Now, to do that, what you can do is you can just take the two curves, which are, of course, describing the same system, and you plot them on the same axis, which you can do by sort of mentally rotating this along the 45 degree line so that it lands on that. And you end up with some kind of pattern of intersecting curves that looks like this. And the key thing is the points of intersection. Where do these curves intersect? Because these are all steady state input-output curves, any intersection point is a quote-unquote stable point of the system. Let me just run through that a little bit more detail, if I can. OK, maybe I don't have the plot slides. OK, so the argument can go like this. That is that at this point where the point curves intersect, if you were to give a certain amount of B at that level, that would produce just the right amount of A to produce the original amount of B. OK. So in other words, the feedback, as analyzed by these curves, means that this is a stable point of the system. And if you happen to have curves which intersect more than once, and you can show that they'll intersect odd numbers of times unless they're very, very peculiar curves, then the outer two points are stable points of the system, and the middle point is something like a transition point. OK, so this system is a bistable system because this is a stable point, this is a stable point, and this is sort of like a transition between these. So how many of you have, most of you have probably studied dynamical systems? Dynamical systems. OK, fine. So you're all familiar with saddle node bifurcations? All right, here's a saddle node bifurcation. OK, here's one steady point. There's another steady point. There's a saddle node bifurcation there. All right, so these are systems where you can sort of imagine a marble on the, on the cusp of a saddle, yeah, right there. It can choose to roll there. It can choose to roll there. But once it's rolled into any of the valleys, it's going to stay there unless it's pushed very hard to, to come back. And so this is, this is a, this is a chem and this comes out of the chemistry. So it is a bistable system coming out of chemistry. So here is one of the earliest models of this kind, which John Lisman uh, from Brandeis uh, studied. And 
he made the prediction that the molecule chemkinase, chemkinase 2 is, which has this marvelous property of autocatalysis, that is it turns on its own activity, can in one molecule do all of these things. I mean you have to have the back reaction which is carried out by, uh, by protein phosphatase 1 in coordination with calcineurin, but the argument is that the positive feedback part of this is provided by chemkinase 2 itself. It's interesting that now actually he thinks that this is only part of the story because chemkinase 2 does not appear to really play the very long term role that he had envisaged, but the basic idea is still there and there are some interesting models that I'll be discussing in a moment. And this as you can see is, is quite a, has quite a long uh, pedigree, long, long term idea and other people had also suggested this around the same time. So now. Let's go back to synapses and our Pavlovian conditioning and say that supposing we had a weak synapse where the conductivity was determined by the amount of receptor say in the synapse, yeah, at the postsynaptic side and you gave your pairing which led to calcium influx which caused some kind of signaling activity which caused the switch to flip, right? Let's say I'm kind of to go on which persuaded more receptors to be present at the synapse, okay? So this sequence of events so hopefully begins to link up the idea of what is happening at the chemical level with your circuit level change in synaptic strength. So let me just run through that again, right? You had your synaptic plasticity rule, which was that you had to have associativity of pre and postsynaptic activity, right? So in other words, the bell had to be followed by the food, bell followed by food again and again. This associativity through repeated, through repeated uh, reiterations leads to calcium influx, leads to signaling activity, leads to the turning on of a chemical switch. When the chemical switch is turned on, it causes more receptors to be present, which causes the, synaptic to come, the synapse to become stronger. And so now you have learned that when there's a bell, you should salivate. Okay, so this in a very, very crude nutshell is the idea that many years ago seemed to have a fairly complete picture of the associativity and the mechanism that would be needed to store information for a long time. Okay, so that was the good old days. And now let's <coughs> take you a little bit for forward and just to, I'll just give you a sort of a bird's eye view of the different kinds of plasticity which we now know are actually present in the synapse and which not just only the synapse but in other places as well which are essential and part of learning and memory. Okay, so here again is the, is the preparation that I described to you right at the beginning. This is your hippocampal slice and what people do is they record from these cells. You, they give input over here, they record over here, and so effectively this is the synapse, this little triangle symbol is the synapse whose strength is being measured. And it's measured in various ways. One is to measure the slope of the signal that you pick up over here. Um, if initially the slope is, is, is small and then after it's learned this peak becomes bigger and so the slope becomes larger and you get a curve such as this which I already showed you about. Yeah, I already told you about this. <coughs> So the different stages of, of synaptic plasticity, um, one is called short term plasticity, another is called early, there's late, there's some, some medium term, I mean there are many, many variants on this. But this is all just to orient you to some of the things I'll be telling you about for the uh, next few slides. Now one of the striking things about plasticity is that it is extremely sensitive to pattern. And you, when you think about it, it's got to be sensitive to pattern, right? If you just went ahead and remembered every single input that came into your brain, even with 10 to the 15 synapses, you would saturate out very, very soon, right? You have to be very selective about what you choose to remember, yeah? So it's okay then if you forget 98% of what I'm telling you now because you have to be selective, right? You have to only remember the 2%, I hope, that is relevant to you, that's, that's going to make some difference to your long-term survival, right? After all, this is all about survival, yeah? So, there are different kinds of, of signals which neuroscientists have discovered are good for causing long-term changes. One of them, as we already discussed, is that you 
simply blast the synapse with strong input in a very, very short period of time. This is called mast stimulus, yeah? So this causes strengthening, but it does not cause protein synthesis, yeah? So this kind of, this is the kind of thing which I, which is like cramming the last, the, you know, the last minute before your examination, right? Um, doesn't work so well. What works is you cram a bit, then you wait, then you cram a bit more and so on. You revise and revise and revise and revise until you're blue in the face, and then you remember it well. And this actually causes, this kind of stimulus protocol causes a protein synthesis for a dependent form of uh, plasticity. They're, these are horribly unnatural things to do, right? Your cells don't go blasting each other with uh, 100 hertz input for a second repeated every few minutes. That's, that's very peculiar. This is a much more realistic kind of stimulus. Uh, theta burst is a, I mean, theta rhythm is a natural rhythm in the brain. And there are stimulus patterns which are meant to be reminiscent of these natural patterns. And this, this turns out also to give very good, robust, long-term plasticity involving protein synthesis. Now, it would also be a really bad thing for your brain if you could only strengthen synapses. What would happen if you just kept on turning up the dial in the connections in your brain? Anybody? You'd just max out everything, right? You'd, you'd literally be epileptic the whole time, right? All your, your whole network would just go into a, a wild cycle of, uh, of self-excitation, and that would be that. Right, so you can't allow that to happen, so what goes up must come down. There has to be a way, and it actually, they, 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 there were quite a few years when it was not at all clear what would bring down synaptic strength. Now, of course, there are many ways known, but here's one of the first uh, clear ways that everybody now uses, which is if you just give a steady one hertz input for 15 minutes to a synapse, it will cause synaptic reduction in strength. Yeah, the minus means that the strength goes down. And this too, interestingly, involves protein synthesis. You can't do it if you block protein synthesis. Now, of course, this is a, one of the more interesting, and certainly theoretically speaking, there's a huge amount of, of interesting stuff that's been done based on spike timing dependent plasticity, which basically asks the question, what was the order of synaptic input coming into the synapse? And this almost goes right back to the slide I showed you with the quote-unquote Pavlovian conditioning, which, was, which came first, the presynaptic one or the postsynaptic one. And the idea here is that if the presynaptic leads the postsynaptic, in other words, if there's a causal chain of events, so to speak, pre followed by post, then you get strengthening. And if it's the other way around, you get weakening of the synapse. OK, so you have to repeat this many times to really get a significant change. But this can be both directions. You can have strengthening as well as weakening, depending on the sequencing. OK, so this is actually pretty remarkable, right? You're, you've, in the previous class, I tried to give you the idea that you can do a lot of clever things with the chemical networks. And here is just one example of some rather complicated patterns and decisions that these chemical circuits have to be able to do. Okay. So let's just leave it at that and say that this is the job of the chemical circuits, and they do it somehow. Let me just remind you what goes into synaptic weight. So this is a classical equation. The weight of a synapse is equal to n times p times q. n is the number of vesicles which release neurotransmitter. A lot of experiments have shown that Basically, every vesicle releases roughly the same amount of neurotransmitter each time it, it goes off, and that causes roughly the same amount of depolarization postsynaptically. So the number of these, if you increase the number of vesicles being released, you increase the synaptic weight. P is the probability of release. That's not hard to, to understand. If you have a greater likelihood that a given uh, action potential will cause release of, of neurotransmitter, you will get a stronger synapse. And Q is the effective release of one quantum which is basically a matter of how many receptors you have present postsynaptically. But in principle, it could be also by increasing the size of the quantum. So these are the factors that go into synaptic weight. And you know, one of the, you know, one of the great things for, for students is when uh, senior scientists disagree vociferously. It's great fun to watch. And I, was, I had the uh, pleasure of being in one of the Society for Neuroscience meetings when there was this vicious debate, and I have to say vicious, it was, it was actually 
unpleasant uh, in retrospect, though it was great fun to watch as a student, provided one wasn't in one of those labs. There was this vicious debate going on about whether synaptic plasticity is presynaptic or postsynaptic. And so there was this marvelous session I still remember, and presumably there are many other such sessions around the world, but the session at Society for Neuroscience where the pre- and post-synaptic camps were at it and bashing each other and telling each other that you know, your results are complete nonsense and all of that, and it was great fun. And of course, even back then, it was apparent to me, and I'm sure to anyone else who was reasonably detached from the proceedings, that yeah, of course, everybody's got to be right on this one. There's lots of good experimental data. They're both right. And yes, now everybody accepts that yes, there's presynaptic change, there's also postsynaptic change, and really you have to think of the synapse as a very tightly coupled unit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was great fun while it lasted. Okay, so all of these things can and do change when you have synaptic plasticity. Take home message, it is both pre and postsynaptic. Stochastic release here, as Angela pointed out. Okay, there we go. So let's go through some of these forms of plasticity and I'll, I'll try and go through it quickly because we are heading towards the, the noon hour when you are all going in search of lunch. So short-term plasticity. So there are various kinds of this. Let me just run you through these. Facilitation, depression, and potentiation, if we can. Up. Oh. Ah, good. Okay, so facilitation simply means that you get a strengthening of the synapse while the activity is coming along. So basically it's very, very tightly coupled to the high frequency stimulus, and once it goes away, the synapse starts behaving back down to baseline. This, the, if you have a slightly longer term effect, uh, potenti short term potentiation, then the, it takes a little while for the synapse to build up strength, and it takes a little while to come back down, but it comes back down to original level, yeah? So the time course may vary, but the end result is about the same. So this is not long-term potentiation. It's not staying up. It's remembering something for a short while, so to speak. But interestingly, you can also get a depression effect. That is, you keep hammering at the synapse, and it sort of gets bored after a while, and so it's, its synaptic strength weakens, and then you leave it alone, and it comes back to baseline. Ah. And many of these things can be accounted for by looking at what happens with uh, the presynaptic side and calcium buildup. So when you first give, when you first give a uh, action potential, you get a certain amount of calcium influx through your uh, voltage-gated calcium channels over here, and that causes uh, vesicles to uh, be released. If you keep bashing at the, at the calcium, you can have two things happen. One is, you could have your calcium retained in the presynaptic side. This calcium builds up, and so the vesicles are more likely to be released, and so you get a potentiation. But you could also get uh, some kind of inhibition of the receptors, in which case you would get depression. You could even have, you could even start to run out of the vesicles that are available to release. So that too could give you depression. So you can get effects in either direction, and all of these things could be happening presynaptically. Okay, so this is a way to get short-term plasticity. Yeah, then it's also fairly clear that different kinds of ion channels, uh, P and Q channels here, are uh, very important, and this has been shown through uh, comparing what happens with wild type, and you can see that the, uh, here's your potentiation followed by slow depression, uh, has a very different profile from this much more rapidly depressing case where you knock out uh, one of the channels, and I've forgotten which one it was, maybe the P-type channel. So there's the wild type and there's the, the case with the, uh, with the knockout. And so different ion channels with different patterns of calcium influx have a different effect on short-term plasticity. And then of course there's the vesicle release bit, which is that this pool of vesicles which is available, if you just hammer at the synapse, you can run out of vesicles and then you can have depression. So all of these things can cause short-term changes in synaptic weight. And this is actually quite likely to be important because this is on the time scale of, of uh, you know, a few seconds to maybe half a minute. And so this could be quite relevant for uh, active neuronal processing. There's a lot of things you can do with short-term uh, short plasticity. Okay. Okay. Now, long-term potentiation. So here we're now talking about plasticity events which stay for basically as long as the system is healthy. And as I mentioned, it can stay healthy for uh, this kind of plasticity has been measured for up to a year. So 
you can have plasticity. And so here is bidirectional plasticity. So here's a three hertz stimulus repeated for a long time. And it causes, what's it causing? Potentiation or depression? What does that look like to you? Go on, take a stab at it. Depression, that's absolutely right. This is causing depression, right? There's the baseline, and now after this stimulus, it's, it's lower. Yeah, so it's depression. At 10 hertz, what's it doing? It's sh only short term, right? There's nothing for the long term. Still at baseline. And at 50 hertz, it's causing potentiation. In all cases, the same number of pulses was given, right? It's just that the frequency was, this was increased, and so the total delivery was shorter. And so this, is, this was an interesting study, which uh, sort of was a biophysical um, implementation of something which I have zipped past. Um, well, I'll come back to it. Uh, called the BCM rule. So I'll come back to that uh, Bean and Stock Cooper Munro rule. Anyway, so this is uh, so different frequencies of input here are causing different kinds of potentiation, and these are all long term. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Okay, so here is uh, your classical STDP plasticity. So a different pattern of input, which gives either depression or potentiation. This is also long-term form of plasticity. Let's see if it works this time. No, nope, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to help out. And here, as I said, are the different kinds of patterns that we discussed. So, and these involve, some of them, many of them, in fact, involve protein synthesis to work. So the, it's now become clear that protein synthesis is not, in neurons, is not something that you have to just sort of leave to the housekeeping guys in the soma to deal with. It's actually an integral part of synaptic change. It's very important in determining the, local, the, the region in which it happens because it so, happen, it so it turns out that you have protein synthesis happening right underneath the dendrites which are triggering the activity, right? So supposing you have a strong plasticity stimulus over here, right underneath that synapse, you will get local synthesis of proteins. It's very interesting, it's, and there's room for a lot of fascinating regulation here, and there's something we're working on acti actively, which is that the mRNA still has to be produced there because there's only one source of DNA in the cell, and that's the nucleus. So it has to be made there, depending on what signals are coming up through the whole cell. It has to be transported down to the, to the dendrites, but the actual synthesis then uses that mRNA and happens locally. So there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with transport and selectivity in this, uh, in this way. <laughs> Thank you. So this leads to an idea which, and this is somewhat of a, a complicated slide, so why don't, we, why don't we just go back? I think the previous slide is a better one for describing synaptic tagging. So supposing you had a strong burst of activity over here on the synapse. It turns out that your neighbor synapse can now have a weak input and sort of piggyback along the protein synthesis that's happening here and sort of steal the protein that is produced due to the hard efforts of this synapse and also get potentiated. Yeah? So this is a process underlying something called synaptic tagging, which basically says that once you've got a strong stimulus in one region, in one very localized region of the dendrite, then neighboring spines are also able to much more easily undergo plasticity. And turns out this is true both for LTP, that is potentiation, and also for depression. So synaptic tagging starts to move away from the original idea that you had extreme specificity, that you have activity on this synapse, and that is the only synapse which is going to be affected. This starts to bring in the idea that plasticity is actually no longer purely the domain, it's no longer homosynaptic, it's no longer just dependent on that one synapse's activity, it also depends on what's happening in the vicinity, so heterosynaptic plasticity. Okay, this sort of is, leads to something that we're very interested in, which is, okay, great, now, you're, now you have all the machinery right there for building the synapse. And like all things in the cell, these are moderately nasty, chemical, uh, complicated networks. 
So what kinds of computation can you do with this? And this is something which Pragati has been working on, and so we've been trying to build up. This is the block diagram version of it. So you get your protein synthesis, and your activity is there. It goes, activates CAM kinase 3, not CAM kinase 2, MAP kinase. It activates lots of nice molecules. And one of the interesting possibilities is that because you're producing proteins which are built part of the synapse, you have interesting feedback loops here. So leaving that aside, this is uh, some work that we're very interested in, what's hap how does the uh, synapse maintain itself. I mean, it's like imagining, you know, um, how many of you have heard of self-modifying computer programs? Yeah, where you write a program which changes the program itself. Yeah, not, not just change the data, but it changes the program itself. Okay, what we have here is a machine which not only modifies the program, it's modifying the machine itself. So this is like the machine is swapping out in and out different coprocessors and, and so on as the computation is going on. Yeah? The, the synapse is rebuilding itself and its neighborhood uh, through all of these synthesis events. So that's why I find this really interesting conceptually. Question? What I mean by that is that your synapse is a molecular machine. Yeah? It's a machine which is taking signals and is doing some computation and generating, generating outputs. But because the synapse is controlling which new molecules get put into the synapse, yeah? therefore, the activity that comes into the synapse is redesigning the synapse itself. Okay, so it's like rebuilding the machine while the machine is running. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Just, just a point of view. Yeah, I find that I find that absolutely, absolutely marvelously bizarre. Yeah, and you know, self-modifying programs are bad enough, but here you have a self-modifying machine, and I think that I'm, I, anyway, conceptually, I, I just like the idea. Yeah, that you can actually build something which works well when it's modifying itself as it goes along. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this is this is one reason why I'm interested in this. Okay. Okay. So. Just so that you have uh, an idea, anyway, this is just some results from our, our modeling studies on this. You have different time courses of combinations of stimuli and so on. I'll, I'll skip over this. Uh, yeah, feedback. So there is now evidence that you can have switches not just at the level of the synapse, but also at the level of the cell. For example, if you have different kinds of reporters of cell-wide activity, so these are different kinds of stains in different regions of the hippocampus. The, uh, dentate gyrus CA3, CA1. So these are cell body stains. And these are stains of, uh, I think, a CFOS uh, driven promoter, uh, where, uh, where you end up with entire cells which seem to be involved in a memory. And if you block protein synthesis, then you don't get this kind of turn on. And the reason why this is clearly involved in memory is, that, is, is because. There are some very cool recent experiments where people have uh, used these promoters to express uh, proteins which can be used to turn off those cells or even kill those cells. So what happens if you remember something and now you've killed all the cells, let's say 20% of your hippocampus, which was part of that memory? So what happens to the memory? It's gone. Yeah? And that's a very strong prediction and that's what actually happens. That is, you can train up the animal. It remembers something, in this case, some kind of uh, fear conditioning stimulus. You knock out those cells, the animal forgets it. And you can go the other way around. You can have a fake memory come in, and you can have even more complicated things with context and so on. So all of these things have been done recently. Just to reiterate the point that you do actually have these cell-wide effects also in memory. Next slide, please. OK, so these are different kinds of, of long-term plasticity that we've discussed. Now let's move on to metaplasticity. And I'm just going to use a couple of slides here. This is the BCM curve, the Bean Stock Cooper Munro curve. And this is very interesting because what it says, so if you remember that experiment of Dudek and Bear, which I showed you, at a very low frequency of stimulus, you don't get any synaptic change. At a medium frequency of stimulus, you get depression, at somewhere in between you don't get anything again, and at high frequency you get potentiation. And you can replace frequency with, say, calcium level or, or something else. 
But the key thing is that following, what happens if you shift this curve? Yeah? Following plasticity, what actually happens, if you can turn on the, go to the next slide please. Yeah? If you shift the curve, so supposing this synapse has already learned something, and now you shift the curve over a little bit. What it, what it happens then is that it, that synapse, it becomes harder to teach that synapse something new. So a frequency of stimulus that earlier was causing it to potentiate will now cause it to depress. Yeah? So the, it's not just the fact that you can have uh, a stimulus which causes a, the cell to learn or forget something, it's that the meaning of that stimulus itself can shift. And that is metaplasticity. So it's not just plasticity, it's a change in the rules that decide whether, whether a given stimulus should cause potentiation or depression. So this is another important form of plasticity. Okay, so let's speed on through this. Structural plasticity is when you actually have gain and loss of synapses or morphological changes. This is now widely accepted as, please, yeah, as very much part of the plasticity process. So again, lots of signaling happens, causes uh, events which uh, have structural implications, and these are things that you can image. So I'll just uh, focus your attention on these two slides. Here's before and after uh, plasticity-inducing stimulus. And I think you can see that uh, there was, uh, if this was the shape of the uh, dendrite with lots of little spines, there are additional protrusions that come up after plasticity. So there are structural changes that are associated with it. And these are almost certainly due to these chemical changes which, in, which have uh, structural consequences that we discussed right at the beginning. Okay, so there's, uh, different kinds of uh, structural change which are expected to be part of plasticity. And one of them is that if you have some co cooperative effects in where the receptors come into the, into the synapse, that can itself cause uh, forms of plasticity. This is something that Harel Shuval has worked on. And uh, another kind of plasticity which I've run into uh, actually by accident was uh, just looking at receptor trafficking. Turns out that this is also a bistable process and can cause long-term potentiation. Next slide. And these are some simulations that we ran. Uh, this actually addresses one of Astrid's questions, which was uh, what happens in the very, very long term. Well, it turns out that uh, this particular kind of uh, switch has a very, very long lifetime. It, it ran for as long as I was able to run the simulation, which was for a year. I mean, it didn't take me a year. It took my it, it was about a week on my cluster, but a year of, of simulated time. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, something which, uh, uh, let's just skip over these. Skip, skip, skip. Oops, okay, so we've gone, we've gone a little bit ahead of ourselves. I'm trying to, I'm, I have my eye on the clock. Unfortunately, I'm facing the clock, so I can see what's happening. If you can go back a couple of slides. I, okay, so, all right, so I'll, I'll, okay, I'll try not to rush it then. So, the th so John Lisman actually had done, John Lisman and uh, Paul Miller and Zhao Jing Wang and other people had done this calculation where they sh showed that uh, CAM kinase 2 could also store information for a very, very long time. They actually ran it for a century, so good for them. Yeah? Um, so you can in principle make switches out of molecular elements which will store information reliably for a very long time. So one kind of, another kind of plasticity which again relates to this self-modifying machine idea which I'm particularly interested in myself, is plasticity which involves movement of molecules to new places. In other words, structural, structural changes of some kind. So here's one which involves uh, stargazin, which is an important st uh, structural molecule whose job, among other things, is to help move AMPA receptors, the, re the receptors for your major neurotransmitter, uh, back and forth uh, to and from the synapse. And it turns on, it turns, so this is a, a little uh, uh, signaling network which analyzes this plasticity. It turns out that this is something which is also stable under stochastic conditions for a reasonable length of time. So you can get a turn on with a brief st strong stimulus and you can get a turn off using a longer weak stimulus. So, and this is, a, this is stochastic calculation, that's why it looks so fuzzy. Next please. And this is based on a general quote unquote theory, which I've uh, come up with, which is basically an abstraction um, on, based on these three principles. 
saying that if you have trafficking between two compartments, let's say the uh, postsynaptic density and the inside of a spine, if you have these uh, assumptions that the trafficking depends only on the uh, couple of molecular states, on the internal signaling and flux balance, you can actually come up with some equations. Next slide, please. Which some equations that look like that, which I won't uh, beat you over the head with. But the upshot of these equations is kind of cool. Next slide, please. The upshot is that if you combine signaling with this trafficking, if you combine the signaling processes with the movement of molecules back and forth, you can get different kinds of molecular identities. So in other words, you can get switching between, uh, uh, you can get basically switching between different kinds of organelle types. You can get maturation and state switching. You can get receptor insertion. This is important for plasticity. And you can even get weird things like oscillations. And I'll be telling you more about this this afternoon when we do the simulations. You'll actually see some of these models. Okay, okay, homeostasis. This I'm going to really fast forward and leave it all to Astrid to deal with. So I will, I will skip uh, rapidly through that just to say that plasticity is not just a matter of changing synaptic weights. You also then have to balance the excitability of the whole cell. And the cell somehow has to have some idea of what is the correct, correct level of excitability that it should be aspiring to. Yeah? And so all of this is again done through this marvelous juggling of the uh, ion channels, their kinetics, and the signaling pathways that, it, that uh, tweak these uh, values. So I'll skip over this uh, very rapidly. Skip, skip, skip. OK, and dendritic excitability and plasticity, I think we can skip mostly through that. Just to say that you do not necessarily have to have plasticity at the synapse. Again, you can have it over fairly large regions of the dendritic spine and these are of the dendrite, and these are actually known to happen. So let's buzz through all of these. Um, I've done lots of simulations on this, and I will, I will skip all of those in the interests of time. Yes. Tell me when to stop. Huh? Tell me when to stop. OK, so let me, let me just leave you with a, a visit to Brazil. OK, Edinburgh Zoo. So here are some of, just, you know, just to give you a perspective on it, here are just some of the, of the signaling circuits that have been proposed that can give you biostability. And I actually have found this, uh, you know, this is something that's taken place over years. And so I, I, I found it a really uh, surprising story as it unfolded because to me, when I started out looking at synaptic plasticity and thinking of biostables as a way to achieve it, it seemed that this is a really exotic, unusual, peculiar kind of chemical thing, which was almost miraculous in its properties. And uh, CAM kinase 2 was sort of the prototypical example of this. And then uh, uh, we came up with the possibility of a MAP kinase feedback loop being one of those. Um, there have been various other uh, suggestions involving protein kinase A. Then the protein synthesis thing came up. AMPA traffic was one that I ran into purely by accident. I wasn't looking for biostability. There, there's receptor clustering. And in fact, um, next one, please. Yeah, so here's the, the CAM kinase 2 one. This, is, this axis is in years, by the way. Yeah. So you give a stimulus here, and the switch turns on, and it stays on for years. OK. So this is just one, one, of, the, one of the creatures in the zoo, the CAM kinase 2 plasticity. If you can go on to the next one. This is the MAP kinase plasticity. It's got, it looks like that. It's just a feedback cycle. Next one. Um, this one is actually not so nice in, when it's stochastic. Um, this is the deterministic curve. But the two blue and the cyan curves are stochastic ones. And you can see that they spontaneously turn on and turn off. So this is actually not a good candidate for synaptic plasticity. It might work on a larger volume scale like the dendrite, but not the synapse. Um, yeah, so this is protein synthesis feedback. Yet another member of the zoo. Next one. Receptor clustering. You've already seen this. These are the trafficking bistables. You've seen some of this. Yes, seen that. Seen that. OK, um, this is sort of the, the family tree, so to speak, of bistables. So we, we, because I was so intrigued by the fact that there seemed to be bistables coming up uh, in unexpected places, I worked with a, a friend, Narain Ramakrishnan. And we did an exhaustive search of all possible chemical uh, permutations. So you take simple reactions and you uh, make a sort of alphabet of them. And then you just build up all possible permutations thereof and make larger and larger chemical systems. 
So we did that, and we found that there's one bistable possible in this very, very small system with three molecules and two reactions. There's just one bistable. And this you can actually search exhaustively in, in these small numbers. If you have slightly larger systems, you get more bistables. And interestingly, they're related to this one. You go to larger systems still, the number of bistables increases. And what, used, what at earlier looked like individual uh, new uh, roots of the family tree turn out to be connected up in the, in the higher branches of the tree. And so as you go up to more and more complicated systems, the number of bistables just sh starts to shoot up. Yes. And does bistable really mean bistable, or could there be multistable ones? So we looked, and we didn't find uh, multistables in this system. But uh, now that I've gone and done the more mathematical analysis, um, I sort of skimmed through that slide, I found quite straightforward ways of making multistable systems. But really, the easiest way of making a multistable system is just to take two bistables and have them loosely coupled to each other. And that can give you multistability. So it's not, it's not hard to do. But oddly enough, this, this set of things didn't turn it up. Uh, you know, maybe we weren't looking closely enough, or maybe the, the, my guess is that the parameter, so this is not a very sensitive way to do it. We sampled, I think, about 1,000 parameter combinations for each, uh, for each uh, bistable, so to, for each putative bistable. And it's quite possible that there were some very narrow regions which we didn't sample. OK, so the point is that they're all related. And the other point, which really surprised me, is that about 10% of everything we tried was bistable. So far from being this really bizarre, exotic, un unexpected uh, pro property of chemical systems, it turns out that bistability is actually something rather easy to come by. And I think, I've, anyway, that was a very interesting and satisfying result. OK, so here's the trip to the bistable zoo. You've gotten to see some of these things. So let me just wrap up and re recapitulate. So I started out with a bit of, whoops, hey, now it's working. Yeah, there we are on the right page. Uh, I started out with a, a bit, little bit of background, you know, why synaptic plasticity is important, and a sort of toy model of, of how uh, this might give rise to what we actually would call uh, some form of memory, the Pavlovian conditioning. And I gave you an idea of, you know, why all of this seemed to be falling very neatly in place uh, some 10 to 20 years, some 20 years ago, uh, when it looked like we had all the elements for quote unquote memory based on uh, these molecular events. Then we started to learn that there are actually many, many, many kinds of plasticity, that there's many examples of each kind of plasticity, that the, the whole picture started to get more complicated, more muddy, and I would have to say more biological, because in biology you have complexity wherever you look, and this was no exception to that. And just to wrap up, I gave you just a picture, you know, a glimpse of how, how many kinds of bistable systems uh, are likely to be lurking out there. And so just to, uh, to wrap up, so synap plasticity is not just a synapse pro property, though I've been emphasizing the synapse. It it's covers dendrites, it covers cells, it covers ne uh, networks as well, and the different kinds of plasticity. There are many forms of it, there are many mechanisms, and it affects everything. So, what you're hearing is now and hopefully processing into long-term memory will go through many, 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 many events, electrical, chemical, different kinds of circuits, different kinds of chemical networks before it's finally stored. And I think this is an absolutely essential part of how the, uh, you know, not just how the brain stores information, but how it works in general. That it's not, you can't separate plasticity from neural processing. It is, it is I think, the, one of the core elements of neural processing. OK, so with that thought, let's uh, wrap up. I think that's the last slide. Thank you. Questions? No questions. Oh, there's a question. Matt. This isn't a very well formulated question, but can you, presumably, by stability itself isn't sufficient for memory because you could have a source that just flips all the time. So, what additional properties of my chemical set? Well, um, I'm not sure where you're going with it, but you need to be very selective about what you allow to trigger the switch. Yeah? Then there's a whole lot of network level questions which help you decide, okay, I've used up this synapse for storing this piece of information. What happens if you 
want to store some other piece of information that might involve those cells. So this is something which uh, uh, I think Abbott and Fusi did a study on not too long ago. So that's another level of question. Um, yeah, I mean, synaptics, bistability is, you know, so really homing in on the molecular level, there's a lot more going on. Ah, okay. I think we probably have somewhere in the region of 10 things that would, I would guess 10 sorts of things that happen. It used to be thought that, okay, there is a chemical switch which would do the trick. But I think there's evidence now, as I said, I went through the zoo, and I'm pretty sure that there'll be a lot more coming. My feeling is that there's probably a reasonable, uh, but a small number of things which are actually used in synaptic plasticity. Of the order of 10 would be my guess. I mean, one argument that's been put forth is that it works very well for, especially for long-term stability despite stochasticity. It works very well if you have a very fast switch. And it so happens that very fast switches, which can respond to very brief kinds of synaptic events, are also the switches which store information for a short time. And you can sort of think of them as very, very sensitive things. But if you follow, if you couple a fast switch and a slower switch, then this fast switch can sort of hold the, hold the information just long enough to cause the longest term slower switch to kick in. And so you can have a cascade of switches which would be able to store information for a really long time and yet respond very, very quickly. So these are some of the ideas that, that I and other people are kicking around. Yeah.